My name is Katia Moskvich, and I'm the editorial lead of IBM Research. And we are here today at IBM Research uh, Europe in Zurich, Switzerland. Next to me here is a full-sized model of a quantum computer. So I know it looks like a really pretty chandelier. I realize that, but actually it's not, even though I would love to have one in my house. I think it looks super cool, but it is a model of a quantum computer. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking today, uh, talking about today, uh, the state of quantum computing. Joining me uh, today is one of my amazing colleagues, uh, IBM physicist Heike Ryle. She's going to be joining us from uh, Quantum Lab here uh, at IBM Research Europe. And uh, she is actually uh, the quantum lead of IBM Research Europe. Fun fact, by the way, before switching to physics, Heike used to design furniture. I think it's actually quite amazing uh, uh, as, um, as far as career switches go from furniture design to quantum computing. Heike is also an IBM fellow. And uh, as of late last year, she actually became uh, a fellow of the American Physical Society, which is a pretty huge honor in physics. So um, before I hand it over to you, Heike, I actually wanted to say welcome to everybody who is watching us. Please do send us your questions on YouTube. We'll try to uh, get through as many questions as we possibly can during the discussion. And uh, with that, Heike, over to you. Uh, tell us where you are. Tell us what, what is that big, weird uh, white cylinder next to you. Yeah, hi, Katya. Great uh, seeing you here, although you are in a different building, right? So we are here live in, the, in one of our quantum labs at the IBM Research Campus in Zurich. And you've seen the pretty picture of the Zurich campus on top at the beginning. It's really a beautiful campus, but it's not only a beautiful campus, but also a beautiful and very exciting lab here. Because we are actually next to a lab where 35 years ago, Nobel Prize winning experiments were done. And my colleagues at that time, they discovered high temperature superconductivity. So back to your question, Katja, of where are we? What are we seeing here? And so behind me or next to me, you see actually uh, one of these, uh, one part of a quantum computer, right? It's a more complex thing. What you see here is a dilution refrigerator. We call it also fridge. And it actually cools down the quantum processor to very low temperature and much lower than actually your fridge at home where you store your food. So it goes down to um, almost zero temperature to about 10 to 20 millikelvin. This is how cold the quantum processor needs to be. And you see, it's also quite a big thing, as you've seen. And we also have connected to the fridge here, then also electronics, where we then can communicate uh, with the quantum processor. So so hold on, Heike, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really cold. But is that, I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that it's like the coldest place in the universe. Is that right? Like it's colder than outer space or something like that? Is that true? That's definitely right. It's actually about 100 times colder than outer space. And um, I mean, this is a demonstration also of what technology is able to do, right? It cools down things. And actually today it's uh, done in a, a you know, quite um, engineered manner. Uh, like 20 years ago, this was much more cumbersome for physicists to do these low temperature experiments. But today, uh, that's really a technology which uh, is um, very much used and uh, not so much of a difficulty anymore. Wow, well, that's that's indeed uh, amazing. Well, um, can we actually see the inside of that fridge or uh, would we be able to, yeah, like to, you know, open it up and see the, the, the model that, uh, that we see here? Yeah, so unfortunately in the lab here right now, we cannot uncover this thing because we're actually doing experiments. So my colleagues, they actually run experiments right now. Therefore, the fridge has to stay complete and cold. Uh, but what you see here now in the video, which is shown, is how this fridge is kind of uncovered uh, to the inside. Um, there are different cylinders which need to be taken off when you need to exchange the quantum processor. And um, they, um, you know, then you see the inner core uh, of the inner life of the uh, um, quantum computer. And uh, perhaps we can also show a more detailed picture of the inner life as we can't see it very well. And I explain a few things towards that. So because we have the electronics outside, we have room temperature outside, but then we go to a temperature 100 times colder than outer space. And so we run actually um, here, the uh, what you see in this figure is actually that the quantum processor 
sits behind this uh, cylinder at the bottom which you see. And uh, this is where the coldest spot is in the quantum processor. And then what you also see are these uh, lines which are running down. And uh, these are superconducting coaxial cables where actually microwaves are transported in order to um, talk to the quantum processor behind. And all this is inside this fridge. Um, it's uh, currently used. And uh, that's why we can't open it, Katya. But wow, well, that, that, that certainly looks um, very futuristic, right? And even uh, much cooler than this model next to me. I, I now feel like I'm, yeah, I, I would love to be next to the real thing. Uh, but also, I remember the first time I visited IBM Research a couple of years ago, and I remember entering the quantum computing lab and uh, like looking around, like thinking, OK, where is the keyboard? Where is the screen? Like, where is the quantum screen? I was thinking, you know, so it definitely doesn't look like a regular computer, right? It looks like, as I said, the chandelier, but not a regular computer at all. And you mentioned uh, microwave uh, pulses, Heike. Is that like the same kind of microwave radiation that I use at home when I I don't know, warm up my pizza in the microwave also. You probably shouldn't do it with pizza, but you know, is that the same thing? Yeah, it's, a, in the, it's also microwaves. It's a bit of a different frequency which we are using, uh, but we use these microwave pulses to actually talk to the quantum processor, uh, to bring information in, to run the calculation, and then also read out uh, the, the result of the calculation. And as you said, uh, it's not really not like a typical typical classical digital computer, as you know, where you have a keyboard and you have a screen and it's used transistors as the smallest parts of it. But it's a completely different um, mechanism and physics behind how these computers work. So actually, in these quantum computers, uh, there are qubits used, so-called quantum bits, which are actually the unit of information carrier here. And um, in classical digital computers, which we all know, we use so-called bits. And we know that they can be a one or a zero. And then we can encode information in these ones and zeros. And we can do um, pro processes of processing of information. So in the quantum computer, it's really working different because the laws of quantum physics are used to do calculation. And so, as I mentioned, we use quantum bits or qubits. And they can be a one, a zero, or something in between. So this is one quantum phenomena. There are actually other quantum phenomena also used for the, the calculations, like entanglement and interference. And because of this uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physics, the uh, power of these uh, quantum computers can be really exponentially different than the classical computers. And that makes them really interesting and uh, really a breakthrough technology which is coming. That sounds really cool, but uh, can we already use them today? Like, can I access one and, and, and use it freely for like whatever I'm working on? Yes, actually you can. And you can uh, do this already since four years. Because already in 2016, we have uh, brought the first quantum computer at that time with five qubits to the world. We made it accessible through the IBM cloud. And people could just uh, you know, um, log in using a normal classical computer to log into the quantum computer and run quantum algorithms on the computer. Of course, um, a lot has changed. right? And uh, for me, it's actually very exciting because when I studied physics, it was kind of a theoretical concept which, we, which was discussed. But now they are real. And uh, in the last four years, so many things have happened. Um, Great technological development and breakthroughs have been accomplished. Uh, we have increased the number of qubits from 5 to 65. Also, the quality of the quantum um, computation was increased, uh, though this is measured in quantum volume. I don't want to go into detail in that. But a lot of things have really happened. So it's not only something which just stands in the lab, like, like here, where we do experiments, but it's actually already moving into um, data centers uh, where they are used through the cloud um, as normal devices. Wow, OK. Well, it does sound very impressive. I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I am you know, positively impressed. Uh, so you know, how can I use them? You said I could use them. So can I use a quantum computer to, I don't know, create like a better PowerPoint presentation or something? Although that's by PowerPoint. PowerPoint probably is not the best example. But you know, why don't you tell us what we can use it for? 
Yeah, so um, it's probably not the best use, to be honest, right? Uh, for text processing or doing better presentations, it's really not the right means because um, you have to solve problems with a quantum processor where the nature of quantum physics can really help you. And, uh, but these um, challenges or these um, problems are actually there in many industries. So these are mathematical problems where the, um, the complexity of the calculation actually increases exponentially with the number of parameters, for example. And uh, this can be in uh, materials analysis or materials uh, development. Um, if you're looking for new molecules, and uh, these molecules can actually um, not precisely calculated by digital classical computers because molecules are also based on the quantum mechanics. And so building computers which intrinsically exploit quantum mechanics uh, is a much better tool to calculate the um, uh, properties of molecules precisely and thus be able to also predict new molecules or new materials. Why is this important? Materials you can find actually in almost every industry. Whether you go into the car industry, um, you need better batteries, you need better materials um, for batteries, you want to have more lightweight materials. Um, if you look into energy, uh, you want to also have like uh, materials which can absorb um, carbon uh, dioxide. So there are a lot of these uh, materials um, challenges where innovation in materials can bring a big value. Also in transport, supply chain, right? You, uh, if you have um, difficult routes, if you have manufacturing processes which need optimization, um, also for finances industry, there are many different examples where these mathematical problems appear, which today in classical computers, we only use um, like approximations, uh, but they cannot always solve your problem. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay, um, I can see that questions are actually starting to come in, Heike. So there is a question for you here. I'm just gonna read it. Uh, doesn't the temperature create problems like some kind of shrinking of the materials due to the low temperatures? Um, yes, it's, I mean, it's right that materials shrink when you uh, cool things down and um, you have to take these type of things into account, right? When you build, for example, devices, then, uh, you know, the materials uh, should have like similar um, temperature behavior. Otherwise, you can run into problems. But there is actually a lot of knowledge in, um, the met in yeah, research in, um, in doing those um, temperature um, characterization and experiments. And so we have learned also how to build those devices uh, that they kind of work and survive uh, these low temperature, that you can heat them up again and that you can cool them down again and they still work. Wow, that, that definitely sounds uh, fascinating. So just uh, to back up a bit, so you were talking about these different uh, applications uh, for, for quantum computers. Um, and uh, I think you mentioned like chemistry and finance. So if I understand correctly, it has to do with optimizations. So maybe I could even like, I don't know, input my picture in a quantum computer. It, it would give me lots of different options of how to, I don't know, style my hair or like get a new haircut. Or do you think we're going to be using uh, quantum computers for, for stuff like that? Or it's never going to be used by individuals, but mostly like to solve global problems? Um, so I'm not so sure about your haircut, whether it helps you there, right? But um, <laughs> as mentioned, there are really very exciting uh, or very important problems, technical problems in many different industries, which can benefit of uh, quantum computers. And uh, there are different classes. One is for sure the optimization. Um, optimization of, as I mentioned, like transport routes um, or in uh, the finance industries, um, if you want to do risk analysis, um, you, ha you have to do Monte Carlo simulations, for example, and also in um, quantum Monte Carlo simulations can help you. So having, we actually have here developed um, in IBM a um, um, quantum algorithm uh, which can be used and this, we also demonstrated that this can create a significant advantage and can speed up uh, the things uh, quadratically. Mm -hmm. Great, um, I have uh, another question that just uh, came in for you, Heike, and it has to do with quantum superposition. Could you please explain to us very simply what quantum superposition is? 
Yes, so that's a phenomenon. Um, you know, having graphs, it's much easier to explain. But let's start like this. And um, you have like a, um, imagine an arrow which can point up or can point down. And uh, so to the North Pole or the South Pole. And uh, this gives you like a one or a zero state, right, represented. And in quantum computing, you can actually create a superposition out of these two vectors. This means you can take a number of times the up arrow plus a number of times the down arrow. And uh, this is a new state, which can also be represented by the quantum bit. And uh, in the end, you can visualize this by the so-called Bloch sphere, uh, where every state on the surface of a sphere can be represented by this um, superposition. And so you can imagine now with this one qubit, you can um, describe every, um, every position on the surface of the Bloch sphere. And this is one, um, yeah, one um, mechanism of why quantum computers are so powerful. Mm -hmm. Wow, so um, just to clarify though, so when you're describing qubits, uh, they clearly behave like atoms, but they are something physical, right? That we actually create, like uh, what's inside uh, um, a quantum computer. Like, uh, can you just descri describe a little bit um, what a qubit would look like, I guess, uh, to, to a human? Yes, a qubit it can also be called kind of an artificial atom. And um, why is it called like this? In an atom, you have like, and it goes a bit deep into, into physics, I'm sorry about that, but you have different energy levels in an atom. And you, in principle, create now an artificial atom, which also has different energy levels. And these, you need two, because these two represent kind of your one and your zero. And um, you can implement them in different physical systems. Um, we actually, what we use here, in, in our quantum computers are superconducting Josephson junctions. And uh, these are actually, it's kind of a, um, we can call it a simple structure because in the end it's two superconducting metal layers uh, which, are, um, which have an insulator in between. And uh, there you can create kind of a quant these quantum states which you can then use for your quantum calculations. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, wow. Um, and where are we today with quantum computers then? Oh, yeah, today it's really exciting. As I mentioned, we have uh, increased the number of qubits. We increased the quality of uh, the, uh, the, the, the measurements and uh, the control of the qubits. We have also, you know, designed and engineered the system to be more robust and stable to kind of improve really all the different parameters. And uh, just at the end of last year in September, we have also announced the roadmap which we are uh, pursuing. In this roadmap, you actually see the different uh, processors, uh, the different quantum processors. And uh, last year we have demonstrated uh, the so-called hummingbird. Uh, it has 65 qubits. And we are now on a path to really um, increase the number of qubits um, uh, continuously. So this year we will, show, we will demonstrate a 127 qubit chip, which is Eagle. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, for each of those steps, we have significant technical improvements which are implemented in these different generations. And in 2022, we show a 40, 433 qubit chip. And then it's really getting also very exciting because we kind of break the 1,000 qubit barrier and reach more than 1,000 qubits in our Condor chip. And again, um, technological improvements are uh, required for this. We are working on them. And uh, this demonstration uh, really is then a demonstration of above 1,000 qubits, and it will allow us um, and also the world, of course, more complex problems uh, to be solved. And um, this is integrated also with, uh, with a whole infrastructure, right? Because it's not only about the hardware. There is also the infrastructure around the software, how to control, how to, um, how to write software, um, developing applications, etc. So there are lots of things which are going on currently. Wow, it's interesting that you just mentioned fundamental problems and uh, uh, we've just actually received a question uh, pretty much about that. Uh, so somebody here is asking, is quantum only for computing faster and having parallel processing or is it also being used for answering fundamental physics questions? 
Uh, that's a, that has uh, different components of uh, this uh, question. And um, because quantum actually is, uh, we call it fast. I mean, often it's called faster, that quantum computers are faster than classical computers. But that's not, uh, we should phrase it differently because they actually use a different way of computation. And so it, for certain uh, problems, they can be faster. But for other problems, like your word processing, what you mentioned at the beginning, they may not be faster. So we cannot kind of generalize it. And uh, mm -hmm. then, but it also can be used, um, and quantum technologies are also used for uh, sensing applications. So um, there is an advantage also for uh, using the phenomena of quantum uh, physics and quantum mechanics for other areas. And um, the third question was also, uh, can we help fundamental basic um, um, experiments or whatever, right? And uh, that's actually exciting because I mentioned before, many of the things are related to materials and improving materials. And uh, so my colleagues have um, um, 35 years ago um, got the Nobel Prize for the uh, high temperature superconducting, but high temperature uh, was still only in the kind of nitrogen, uh, liquid nitrogen region. And so the whole community is kind of looking also for high temperature, really high temperature, which means kind of room temperature um, superconductivity. And actually quantum computers may be able to help, right? And uh, if, uh, if, we, if we have the right um, system around, then um, the hope is also to predict materials which can sol solve those fundamental questions. Wow. Okay. Well, um, and so just uh, to go back to what you were saying about uh, the qubits and how, like, the superconducting qubits and how we are making them. So, if I understand correctly, you know, quantum computers of the future will have like thousands of these physical qubits, these physical things, right? That we're going to be cramming into this wonderful chandelier here, right? So I just can't imagine if we're cramming thousands and thousands of them in there at some point this whole beautiful thing is just going to collapse, right? Yeah, so of course there, uh, you know, this is kind of the start. It's not the end. It's, uh, there is uh, a, um, I mean, this is also a small fridge, right? And for bringing that, um, like millions of, uh, of um, uh, cupids into such a fridge, it needs also different technology. And I said for each of these um, steps, we have new technology coming in. And one of the things which comes in uh, beyond the thousand qubit is uh, really kind of a so-called super fridge. So uh, this is one technology which we are working on, this uh, so-called um, golden eye. And we also have a, uh, have a picture here where you see it. It's, uh, you see the dimensions, right? I'm standing next to this one. So, and um, um, Jay, um, who is our uh, leader of the, uh, of the quantum program, he is actually inside this new fridge which we are developing. And uh, this is also technology which we in-house develop um, in order to go to the next level, to really prepare everything and uh, for being able to build also quantum computers uh, with millions of quantum bits. So you see the fridge here is about uh, 10 foot high and uh, 6 foot uh, wide. And uh, it's already tested and, um, and, you know, certain feasibility tests are made and there is further development towards having this ready when we then, uh, you know, get to these numbers. This is one example, um, but the other thing is if you have, if you continue scaling the number of qubits, then you also want to have technology available which actually connects different uh, quantum processors. So we are working also on connecting different quantum processors and uh, so kind of create like an internet of where different quantum processors are connected with each other. Okay, wow, great, thank you for that. Um, another question from the audience here, uh, kind of personal question, what use cases are you working on, Heike? Uh, so I, I don't necessarily work on application use cases, but my team here, so Stefan Werner and also Ivano Tavanelli and the team, uh, with colleagues around the world at IBM, they're, and they're working on uh, use cases, and also actually with a lot of partners in industry, uh, because you know we are the compute experts, and uh, we are we work together with partners who are the industry experts um, to figure out what are the relevant use cases 
in each of the industries to go after and provide really the quantum advantage um, and the value for the industry. And so I hope, uh, you know, next time, Katya, for your next uh, um, webinar, I already have a suggestion to invite uh, Stefan and Ivana. They can tell you then more about their quantum application they are working on. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds fascinating. Um, another question here. If someone wants to work on quantum software development, what would you need to study? That's an interesting one. Yes. No, actually, this is... Um, changing uh, quite a lot because uh, we are developing a lot of the software stack. And today we actually have made an important announcement um, also to really make it easy, make it frictionless for people to develop quantum applications and use quantum computers. So we have uh, for what do you need to study? I mean, today I would recommend um, take computer science, for example, right? But also have uh, quantum uh, courses. And I think that's actually where a lot of, um, but also physics and the computing courses. So I think it's right now actually a mix because you should have a bit of a quantum, uh, quantum physics background, but also have skills uh, on the other side. And in the end today, we are really, um, you can use quantum computers already by just knowing Python and, um, and um, yeah, uh, work with our KISS, with um, the open source Qiskit um, mod work software to use quantum computers. So actually, it's a very easy um, level to go into um, a, yeah com programming quantum computers and work with quantum computers. And um, I mean, yeah. So these uh, programs also in the education area are there's a lot of dynamics because in former time. As I mentioned before, uh, only physicists kind of work with quantum computers and program them, but this is really changing a lot. Today, the, um, these courses are already happening for all the different um, um, right, um, study subjects, whether it's uh, from engineering, computer science, chemists, um, and, and et cetera, to uh, kind of bring the basics for quantum computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, and in my mind, uh, now we kind of come, now that we mentioned education, uh, we come to the most important topic of, of this discussion anyway. Uh, Heike, do you think the world is actually ready for quantum computing? I mean, um, okay, we've got, uh, we've got these machines, right? And, but but um, you mentioned that they're not, uh, we haven't reached quantum advantage yet, so they're not better than classical computers just yet. But imagine if, if, they, if we do reach quantum advantage, say, tomorrow or like a week from now or even six months from now, do you think the world is ready for quantum computing? Like, will the companies around the world suddenly all be able to, like, know how to use it, what to use it for um, or not? What's, what's your view on that? Are we ready for quantum computing? Yes, I think people are getting ready, right? And I would say you better get ready because it's really a very dynamic environment. A lot of things are happening. Uh, the technology is developing uh, very fast and uh, different to classical computers. The scaling behavior of quantum computers is also different. So um, it's not like a linear scaling as we are used to in, uh, in the uh, normal transistor area, but it's really um, scaling with a different behavior. And so we expect that in uh, at the in 2023 2023 actually uh, we there is kind of a turning point where then we can demonstrate quantum advantage and uh, you are then better ready to can use quantum computers so what does it mean using quantum computers right um, you should have identified like the uh, the um, areas where quantum computers can help you in your industry. What are the biggest pain points, the biggest challenges? Where is the fit with quantum computers? And um, this requires, and also, of course, that you have a workforce which has um, a team uh, which knows a bit about quantum and can have the industry ex expertise and can then also together kind of identify uh, these workloads. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, we are really in a dynamic world where you have to get ready uh, because quantum computers are there and they will develop fast and then there's an advantage and you are better able to use it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I am just getting more and more questions here, and uh, the next one is actually um, we're gonna we're gonna jump back to the beginning of the discussion. I'm sorry for that, Heike, but uh, just rewind a, a little bit. This um, uh, audience member is asking, can you please explain how quantum entanglement is used in how the quantum computer actually operates? Yes, yeah, so entanglement um, is actually one of these uh, behaviors uh, which is also very weird. Um, because you kind of bring um, cupids together, you entangle them. This means they are, suddenly have properties which are really connected with each other. Then you separate them and you change one, you measure one, for example, and you exactly know also what the property of the other one is. And uh, these are weird things which we are not used to in, uh, in our daily lives in the classical world. But in the quantum world, they can be created, uh, cupids can be entangled. And uh, they then also provide kind of um, the advantage uh, or the power which uh, is utilized by the quantum computation. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember reading uh, that um, Albert Einstein once said that quantum entanglement was like spooky action at a distance. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because as you say, uh, if one atom or qubit in this case changes its state, the entang entangled partner, even if it's like light years away, will simultaneously change its state too, which is like, pff, in, I don't yeah. know, it's completely mind blowing, right? Yeah, because I mean, at that time, right, when, uh, when, the, uh, the, uh, when it was clear that light travels at a constant speed and uh, light is needed to kind of uh, transfer information, uh, this was a real phenomenon, people, it was very hard to understand. And it's, it's still kind of is, right? because it's not in our classical world present. So I think we also kind of get to, get, get to have this, or this intuition um, and, uh, for quantum um, mechanics and quantum behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so you, you, you were talking earlier um, about how uh, people could uh, use quantum computers even today. And I would assume uh, you know, in the future, the process of actually uh, connecting to a quantum computer would be uh, would be similar, which is through the cloud. And we've we've got a question here from one of uh, our audience, uh, uh, from our, one of our viewers, um, who is asking how are quantum computers actually hosted or you know connected to the cloud? If you can explain uh, the way they are connected to the cloud. Okay, I mean today uh, we uh, you know we have a certain architecture, perhaps we can also show the, uh, the development uh, roadmap in that regard, um, which also shows a bit holistically how we integrate uh, the, the, so the hardware, the software, and also then the building the applications. And um, we, need, we need to connect, um, of course, the quantum computer, which is sitting here, to classical computers and through these classical computers in the cloud, you actually have the access. So that's why you can connect with your mobile phone or with your classical computer to the cloud and uh, can access our quantum computers. But of course, there's a lot of things uh, behind, uh, which may go a bit too much into detail to explain here. But um, we are, because you, you run certain circuits and uh, you run algorithms and uh, we are, continuously also um, developing that the architecture, which is actually uh, has been uh, announced today, so that's really brand new. Uh, this is an announcement of today, which you see, how, which is a holistic and integrated picture of the full stack development, uh, which we do from the hardware to the software and also um, the applications part and providing then also the, uh, the service through the cloud. And uh, because we talked a bit about also the, what do you need to know in order to use quantum computers. And of course, in the end, we want to have like a frictionless development and frictionless use of people using quantum computers. This means if you are in chemistry and your job is to um, design new drugs, then um, you should kind of use the software and the tools which you are used today. But behind the scene, quantum computers are used in order to solve the problems but you should not need to learn kind of special things in order to use them in the most efficient way. Yeah, I think you, you've just actually addressed uh, the next question we have here, which is um, about exactly that. So somebody is asking, 
would one uh, write custom quantum algorithms for applications now or would algorithms mainly be written uh, by academia or quantum experts and only used by by in by the industry so what what's your view on that i, I guess it's, it's different now and and uh, what you've just described was a roadmap right yeah exactly it's different now but we are constantly developing and to make it much easier for everyone to use quantum computers and not be a specialist of you know how i mean you have to kind of translate your problem into a quantum algorithm uh, and then it depends also on the hardware how you implement it and so you really need um we are developing this whole um infrastructure that for the user it's really frictionless to use them mm -hmm. And so um, if we uh, go back to what we were talking, like when we were talking about education and, and universities, so what, what is happening today? I mean, uh, for people to actually understand what quantum computers can, can offer them in the future, do you think uh, more universities should be kind of actively introducing quantum computing into their curricula and maybe even on a high school level? And it doesn't like, I don't know, in my view, it doesn't even necessarily have to be about programming specifically, but just to kind of introduce like 16, 17 year olds to, to this idea that soon in the future, it will like, if they will go into like material design, for example, they may have access to these machines that are, that, that are just, you know, coming online uh, and will hopefully uh, become fully functional in a few, a few years from now. So do you think we should do kind of more in terms of educa educating the future workforce in, in, in that regard? Yeah, of course. I mean, there is uh, much more to do. It's also, of course, an exciting uh, topic to learn about, and uh, it will have quite some impact in the future. So as said, right, you're better prepared for it. And um, this means there are also different dimensions, of course. Um, at the universities, for example, and in research, there is a, a really dramatic increase in also using quantum computers and working on algorithms. And so, um, if you look around, whether it's in Europe or US and everywhere, um, the universities expand their programs in quantum computing, in the theory, and also using quantum computers. There are extra curricula made for, as I mentioned before, not that only physicists learn about quantum computers, but that also quantum computers, how to program them, how to use them, is uh, uh, taught um, to engineers and chemists and um, you know, even finance experts, etc. So it's really broadening. This is what we see. Um, we also uh, develop actually quite a lot of, uh, yeah, in, in tools uh, and also programs uh, where we help uh, to bring together and to explain quantum computing, help uh, people using quantum computers, show them how to program them. You can see, uh, for example, YouTube videos where you can dive into detail and in how to do it. Um, and uh, also in co collaboration with universities. So that's the university level. Then if you go to the company level, it's again uh, also, I mean, in the end, you want to also educate your workforce in quantum computing. You want to build up a team also of experts that they can identify um, the use cases and can also lay out a strategy for, uh, for making use then of the quantum advantage and uh, integrating it. In the high school, it's an interesting topic also because I personally think um, the earlier you kind of get in touch uh, with these weird phenomena, um, the easier it may be for you to grasp it and to think like it, right? Um, I'm, Jake Ambetta also once said, you think too classically. And I think the earlier we start to, um, to see and visualize and experience quantum behavior, uh, then the more an intuition we can, uh, you know, ex ex yeah, get, get. And having an intuition also helps to then actually become creative in that space. And uh, so I think learning early, the way how to do it is of course different than how you how do you do it after you may have studied a certain subject. Um, but I think there are cool things. I mean, for example, a colleague here, he looks into quantum games. Uh, so using the quantum physics and uh, uh, exploring how to use quantum computers in the in games and that's also one way to kind of uh, you know get in touch with it and be excited about it and then learn about it yeah absolutely i mean quantum gaming a quantum video games it's completely i don't know mind-blowing i think uh when you're when when you're 
playing a video game and, and you know that it's been designed on a quantum computer or maybe like you yourself could like design a, a quantum video game, I, I think it's, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, so we've got another question here, actually. Uh, we, we've talked about it a little bit, but uh, Heike, could you just explain maybe a little bit more in detail for our viewers, what is actually quantum advantage? Yes, uh, so quantum advantage we define um, as the state where we solve a problem which is of high value um, with quantum computers which cannot be solved with any biggest supercomputer you can ever build in the world. And uh, this is something where we expect this to come um, end of 2023, where we have uh, reached kind of the thousand cubit barrier and have uh, broken this barrier. And uh, there, there should be then problems which really can be solved and provide the value with quantum computers. Today, as we discussed, uh, these are smaller problems we can solve, but we learn a lot, right? Because we learn about how how to write the quantum algorithms, which then can also be used with a scale quantum computer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. And um, so we, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, creating more and more of these uh, qubits and hopefully, you know, at some point uh, there will be hundreds, thousands of these qubits and uh, we'll, uh, we'll reach the point of uh, the qubits being, uh, you know, qu quite, quite uh, good quality, right, so to speak. But do, do you think, I mean, there's a term in, in quantum computing, error correction. So what could you just explain? There's one of one of our viewer, viewers here is asking mm -hmm. what actually is uh, error correction? What, what is it? Why, why is it important? Yeah. So error correction is actually something which is used also in, uh, in classical computers, right? In a memory cell, for example, when you store information and you also you have ones and zeros, but sometimes an error happens and then suddenly the zero switches into a one and uh, this brings you an error. So what you do is actually in classical, you kind of copy the things uh, and have like three times the one. You store not only one one, but you store it three times. And then if one switches, then you say, okay, that's uh, that may be an error and you can correct for it. And in quantum computing, that's unfortunately not so easy because uh, there is also quantum physics where you say you cannot copy a quantum state. So you need to find other tricks um, but you also have like noise in the system and you may also, when you do your calculations and apply your gates, you may, um, in, um, how do they, the errors may appear. And so you also have to, in the end, correct for those errors uh, to uh, get the exact results. And um, this is important for the universal quantum computer. So we can also already um, do calculations like quantum simulations if, uh, if qubits have still some errors. And uh, this error correction needs then um, a number of qubits which uh, work together in order to correct for this error which may appear. So the, uh, the, uh, the error corrected qubit has kind of more qubits than a physical, is, are more qubits than a physical qubit. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, yes, it's uh, fascinating that physicists are already working on this error correction, kind of looking into the future, right? And uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. So when, once we get there, once we uh, are able to create uh, more and more of these physical qubits, we'll also hopefully be able to then apply these methods that we are working on today and correct those errors. So it's, it's really a um, work of the future, kind of shaping the future in, 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 my, in my opinion. Um, but um, what, what about the infrastructure, though? So, for instance, if, um, you know, if we do reach quantum advantage, and hopefully we will reach quantum advantage, and then uh, everybody starts, uh, as you say, like, you know, there is uh, education and workforce development, and suddenly the whole world is using quantum computers. So how is it going to be? Can you just describe, like, uh, how many machines are we going to need? Are they going to be all tucked away in data centers? Or, like, what is it going to actually look like? Yeah, so, um, I mean, so just coming back to you, the error correction you mentioned, I mean, at, you know, when we are about the 1,000 qubit barrier, then we can also start to do error correction. And then really the, uh, the things uh, getting, getting a big momentum even more. And for the infrastructure, this means then you're able to, you, you get the quantum advantage. Um, and then there is also, of course, even more need for quantum computers. And we already see a lot of need for quantum computers. So we started in 2016 with one quantum computer online. Today, we already have 32 quantum computers online. 
And what does it mean? Uh, today, they're actually in um, data centers. And as you know, a lot of data centers are used. Um, there are many um, kind of mathematical problems I mentioned where you could use quantum computers. So I see this really expanding very much. And uh, a, I mean, you know, someone said uh, when the digital computers have been uh, used um, or started in 1943, actually Watson said, oh, there will be not more than five uh, computers in the world. And I think this, uh, you know, we already passed. So uh, it shows also a bit, I mean, looking back um, and you look at the semiconductor industry 70 years ago, would people have imagined that we, you know, use mobile phones for doing complex calculations? Uh, that you have mobile phones, that we do a video chat and all these things. So you see that actually having quantum computers, there will be more things which can be done with them and there will be more development which actually expands into things which we may not be able to envision even today. And so I think it's therefore it's really a very exciting time also to be part of this mission to create more complex uh, quantum computers uh, to make to reach the quantum advantage and to apply them in uh, for very relevant problems mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, i mean quantum center quantum data centers of the future it just really sounds super cool um but what about um ai like artificial intelligence and there's somebody asking here uh, how can quantum computers help in deep learning and, and indeed i mean uh, we are making tremendous progress in in AI, right? So I would uh, I would assume that uh, AI and quantum computers will kind of have to will have to work together somehow, right? What's your view? Yeah, there actually also one application which I uh, did not yet mention is machine learning, uh, quantum computers uh, and machine learning. And there's also a lot of uh, research and um, and development going on to develop new algorithms and also to figure out how can quantum computers help? And actually recently also uh, quite important the, um, work has been done within IBM to demonstrate that uh, the entanglement and um, quantum feature spaces can really help um, to improve the classification in data sets. And so we have also research projects where we, for example, work also together with a CERN here in Switzerland. As you know, they have very complex data sets uh, they have the uh, Large Hadron Collider. They are preparing for new detectors co to come where they get lots of data sets uh, or lots of data. And they, are, they can actually not store all the data. So they have to extract patterns from the beginning. And so they just kind of then store the extraction, but this means they cannot go back and check later. And so with quantum computers, you could, because of the dimensionality, you can explore higher dimensional patterns or use uh, the uh, uh, the quantum computers and the entanglement to get um, to use quantum feature spaces where you can do a much better classification, thus provide also an advantage. So that is currently explored, uh, and there are other similar examples uh, in also for machine learning. Mm -hmm. Well. Um we have about eight minutes left, so probably just enough time for two, three more questions. Uh, Heike, I know it's, uh, it's getting pretty late in, in Zurich, uh, and everybody probably wants to go have dinner. Uh, but this one is pretty good. Could you tell us what are other interesting scientific uh, technological developments that could influence the development of quantum computers? So it's an interesting question. I mean, Technologies, which uh, I've mentioned one, right? If you look at the at the uh, uh, fridge, uh, because such a fridge is needed to really build the, the million to enable the millions of devices cooled. Uh, then there are also other implementations of quantum computers, which you can think of where um, also more progress uh, is needed. And uh, then materials analysis um, in order to further improve the quality of the quantum bits understanding where noise may come from, which uh, is observed. And uh, also quantum computers can perhaps in the end help by developing new materials, uh, which then also provide um, new insights and uh, improvements for the current technology. Mm -hmm. There's also electronics, uh, which is developed. Um, so the holistic system is really um, you know, improved and further developed um, in order to move to the bigger systems. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I guess we only have time probably for the last question here, and it's an interesting one. It's on security. So uh, what is quantum safe cryptography and does it actually exist? Um, so so um, can you repeat the question? Actually, I, I didn't hear it well. What is quantum safe cryptography and does it exist? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so quantum safe cryptography. I mean, people may ask, what is it, right? Um, what does it mean? And um, quantum computers are so powerful uh, or will become so powerful in the future that uh, they may be able to actually um, um, factorize big numbers, uh, which is for classical digital computers not possible. Uh, they may need like billions, uh, um, billions of years, but a quantum computer could, uh, using Shor's algorithms, if you have a universal quantum computer, then do this like in hours. And uh, this is still far away, but uh, this is kind of a risk that then the current cryptography would no longer work. And, uh, and therefore, we actually already also here at IBM develop quantum safe cryptography. And uh, this is a different um, mathematical um, algorithm you use in order to encode your information. And uh, this can actually not be um, solved uh, very quickly by quantum computers. So it's a mathematical problem where quantum computers would not provide a speed up in order to then um, decode the information. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, currently developed. I mean, there are um, um, quantum um, safe algorithms. There are like suggestions and there is actually also competition of which ones will win and then will become a new standard for how to encode um, stored information. And um, some of, as I mentioned, we have a team here who is working on this and they already implement this also in, in storage, um, in storage uh, parts that uh, this can be sold and uh, make your information already today safe mm. for future, for computers to come. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Heike. That's, uh, that's really, really amazing and informative. Um, one last question I have. When do you think we're going to have a replica of that to take home as a chandelier, really? You know, I mean, we can use uh, our skills, right? As you mentioned in the beginning, I have a uh, furniture making background, so we exactly. can build our one. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That's what I wanted to hear. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heike. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here today. Uh, if you have any other questions, just find us on Twitter, and we'll be happy to get in touch with you. And hopefully, we'll see you at some point soon again. Thank you, and bye. Thank you, Katya. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.